All right, welcome everybody to June. It's June 1st, and this is the Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. As you are probably all aware, um, two things that we must abide by. The first is the antitrust policy. Uh, so we do not participate in any, any activities that are prohibited under any antitrust or competition laws. The second one is our code of conduct, which is linked in. Uh, so for an announcements today, uh, we do have this standard announcement of the Dev Weekly developer newsletter that goes out each Friday. If you do have something that you want to include in that newsletter, please do leave a um, comment at the link uh, that's in the in the agenda. For quarterly reports, uh, we don't have any quarterly reports that are due today. I don't think we have any outstanding quarterly reports. I think they've all been merged. So thank you all for that. Um, we do have still the sawtooth report that is past due. I haven't seen anything on there since last week uh, when Rai spoke to the, the sawtooth community. So we're still looking to get that in to us. Uh, as far as upcoming reports, we do have the cello one that is due today and the Firefly one that is due next week. So uh, any questions um, at this point or announcements since I forgot to ask if anybody else had any announcements? Victor? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, there is a small announcement uh, with the message in the chat. I've published the LFX mentorship platform issues. Uh, it is an article with the things that we can actually improve in LFX platform. So we request this uh, change because the use of the platform was really inconvenient so far. And hopefully it helps. I'm not sure well, where to place this article. So if somebody could help me with announcement in Discord and uh, how to place it in Wiki properly, that would help a, a bit. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like Rai just put a link in the TOC chat uh, for this meeting, uh, for the June 1st meeting a thread. If you would like to take a look, it talks about the LFX mentorship platform issues, unless this is the actual um, link that uh, you were referring to. Yes, I believe it is. If it's okay. Uh, okay. Great. Um, so, yeah, I guess we'll have to take a look at that and see what it has to say. And uh, we should probably get the LFX mentorship team involved in helping with any sort of issues that might occur on the particular platform. All right, any other announcements or any comments up to this point before we hand it off to David? Okay, I will take that as no. Uh, so David uh, is going to present to us why to contribute to Hyperledger. And I think David, if I recall correctly, part of this is also to get feedback from the TOC and folks on the call to um, help improve this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. So yeah, to your point, I mean, we're trying, as we talked about last week, we're trying to create some resources that will be helpful for, for everybody on this call and all the other maintainers to have conversations uh, with people on your end about why working in the open is valuable, why it can help meet your organizational goals. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. We want your feedback. Is this the right track? Is this something that would be useful? You know, are we hitting the right points? Are we reaching out to the right audience? I think one important point to, to cover that Arno brought up last week is there's probably going to be a lot of different audiences. So there's really not going to be just one presentation. So I think I am just sharing one presentation today, but we might need to iterate on this and, you know, change it for, for different people and have different points. So just keep that in mind as I go through. This is by no means done. And it's also just for one specific audience that I had in mind. So this might not be the right content for a different audience. So we might need many ver versions of this. So one point of feedback may be, hey, this was good for your audience, but what about, you know, these other people too, you know, and we might need 
a whole different approach. So just for that context, the audience I had in mind for this one was I had just noticed recently that with restarting the work on Explorer and Burrow as labs, it's been interesting to see that those projects, even though they were end of life, did have users. And once we end of life to them, they showed up and said, hey, I was using that. So I wanted my my thought was let's try to get in front of that so that's the audience here like let's reach out to people who are using a project but not contributing to it yet and that again is one audience and there may be other audiences too so uh, i'll just go through this and again any feedback you have is certainly welcome uh, um, and some of this i'll scoop over because obviously we know some of the basics but i was going to start with just some information around open source collaboration and just talking about that uh, um, but I think the, the core of it is this part about why contributing adds value. And again, I think in many cases, I think we just assume that people understand that because, hey, you're here, right? You became a member or you're you're here in a call. Obviously, you, you are in the community to some degree. So we just kind of assume that you understand that getting further involved would add value, would, would add value. But I don't think we have always made that explicit in the past or or as explicit as it could be. So I think it's really helpful just to be very clear about this. So I think here are some points that I think are relevant for people. And again, really looking to your feedback, but I think one point that's very relevant is showing up and using open source is one thing, but contributing is a totally different. Like if you use open source, you're kind of taking whatever is getting created by other people, but if you're contributing yourself, you can shape the direction of the project to fit your specific needs and use cases. Uh, um, and again, I think this is really relevant for, for example, the Explorer users, when they were using but not contributing to it, they were kind of at the mercy of whatever the other contributors made, right? But I'm sure they had their own needs. So if they were contributing to it, they can shape the project of the, of the you know, shape the project in the direction they wanted to go in. And then again, for the Explorer one, if you contribute to a project, you can make sure your pro a project you rely on stays active and doesn't stop, right? I, I think for a lot of people, they're not familiar necessarily with the mechanics of an open source project, and uh, they don't realize that projects could you know, go end of life. So in a minute, I'll talk about the project life cycle, and I think that's helpful to inform people about too. Um, I think another really compelling argument for for why contributing to open source is useful is you can decrease the time it takes to you know get something done and accelerate the work of the project. I think you know this is something where you can say if you do it all on your own, it's going to take a certain amount of time. But if you can do this with a much wider community and other people are doing other parts of what you want to do because they also share the same goals, you can get stuff done quicker, right? Um, and I think lastly, you can tap into a worldwide group of people who are interested and want to, to help, right? We have people from all around the world who are interested in something similar to us. We all have a similar mission by being here and you really could tap into that group. So these are a few points. Uh, um, I'll, I have others uh, uh, down below, but uh, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll pause here for a minute. Are these relevant? Are there any big points that you think are missing at this point? Because this is kind of the core, the core kind of why part. The rest is kind of getting into more examples and, and more mechanics of how. Um, Stephen, a, a quick point would be it'd be really nice to, um, while this is necessary um, in this form, it would be uh -huh. really nice if you could share the list of com the list of statements. I'd like to go through them and and sort of think through each one i think i think there's more to it um that could be done and tweaks made but i'd love to just see them as a list <laughs> i i don't know where that is or how i could get it but i would mean to see separate it. from a separate from this presentation like well, formatted differently or but just like a a literal list in a comment so that i can see them one after another they're really nice concise um I'd love to play with them a bit and think about them. Sure, sure. I'm just a copy paste into something. Sure, I'm taking a note. That's great, copy and paste. So just easier to just easier to go through and think through them all and and sure. think about what find each one. Sure, 
And yeah, and then we can format them into a nice presentation. After. Exactly. Um, the the thing I'm thinking is it's it's somewhat missing the the selfish motivation of the individual. <laughs> okay. Um, looking and, and what's and 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 adding some and I I might have missed them and that's why I want to see them all sort of together is gotcha. uh, you know that that idea that that you can contribute or put a portion of your team on to contribute to it and have and still build something that 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 is your own to to build off of um and gotcha. and, and there's a balance there and I just I, I want to make sure that's in there and and just to see them overall together that's a good point. Yeah, just because. Yeah, exactly. You, you can then create your own thing, even if it's done in the open. You can still have a part of it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point. Oh yeah, absolutely. I can format this, uh, copy and paste, and put it in a, in, in a different format so it's easier to scan and edit and play with. I guess if I could throw one more, um, a lot of what we do is based on standards and protocols and. Um, Again, that sort of it's in your interest to build out these common components so that you can build value for others um, around those. But um, if you don't, you know, if we don't build the core components together and, and sure. make them open for everyone, you don't get that. You don't get that yeah. ability. To, you can't do it alone. That type of you can't do it alone. So, again, uh, maybe covered in there. I just would like to see. No, I, and, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And, yeah, I just wanted to say, Stephen, I did just put in the thread for this meeting. I copied and pasted them from the presentation into a uh, single message, so you can take a look there and yeah, see all all of them together and see if there's something that you think might be missing too. And that goes obviously for everybody if if it's easier to see them together. And I'm guessing in the chat, you probably put a link to this presentation that I probably could have looked at too. But uh, well, I could definitely include the link to the presentation. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I think it's on the agenda. But yeah, we could drop it. I in the know, chat I'm too. guessing that it's in the agenda. I probably could have just gone and looked at that. But so anyway, thanks. And everybody should have access. If, if people don't, let me know. I think I had set the permission that everybody could view and comment. But if you're having access issues, let me know. I'll double check. But that's helpful, Stephen. Thank you. And this brings up a point. I have a few other kind of why comments later, and it felt to me that you we could probably have 20. I, I didn't know what the right balance was, right? Like, and again, that maybe speaks to the audience, right? Like, if we have 20 really good reasons, we don't have to share all 20 with every single person. Maybe some are going to be more relevant for one audience. And so maybe we can, having them all on the list, we can kind of pick and choose, hey, for this audience, these four things are what's going to be really compelling, right? And then you can kind of pull those out and use those, right? Um, any other comments before we move on? All right. So as I mentioned before, I think at least in this case where people maybe aren't familiar with the project life cycle, it's really helpful to go through that. Uh, I think everybody here is familiar with it, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. But, you know, I think, again, for the audience I had in mind on there, it's useful to help people understand that, you know, when a project doesn't, have anybody contributing to it anymore that it is possible for the TOC to come in and say, hey, this is no longer active. Maybe this is now dormant, or maybe this is deprecated, or maybe it's end of life. And so I think, you know, just explaining people to people who maybe aren't familiar about the life cycle felt useful in this case. And going into the the story of Hyperlibric Ledger Explorer, again, felt useful. Um, again, maybe not for all audiences, but here, just to explain that this was an active project, the existing explorer, excuse me, the existing maintainers had changes that made them move off the project. There was nobody else to carry it forward, so it moved into life, even if there were users, right? That's not having users or not is really not the important part about the life cycle. It's really who's showing up and contributing, right? So, you know, we kept, and we heard this with Composer too. I think there's many end of life projects where we could point to this, but, you know, people show up and said, hey, I was using that. And I, again, this was the audience that I wanted to, to share this particular message with, uh, um, you know, but I, it was just amazing to me, you know, we heard that people were not only using Explorer, but also can making it better internally on their end and just not contributing those changes back. So, right. It feels like there's, you know, a, 
they see value in improving it, but we hadn't made the case about why contributing those changes back. So this to me felt like a gap. I heard it at the last member summit we had, you know, I've heard it kind of anecdotally when people show up and said, hey, I was using that, why did it move to end of life? It just feels like we have not made the case to those people if they're making improvements to it internally and not contributing those back, right? Uh, but it has been really encouraging to see that organizations have been, you know, now that it has been in life to have shown up and they're now contributing this as a lab. So um, this is just talking about that story. Um, David, Sean. before you move yep. on, Arno has his hand up. Yeah, if I may, I just wanted to interject a couple of ideas. Of sure, sure, sure. I mean, the, the, the first one is, well, you know, just because we're Kive uh, project doesn't mean people cannot keep using it, right? It's just a way for us to signal, well, this is no longer maintained. Uh -huh, absolutely, and, sure. Right. But maybe indeed we also, the other point is, maybe we need to to more, to more be clearer, uh, you know, that this is about to get archived unless somebody, you know, steps up and decides to become a maintainer. Yeah. So I don't know if people are surprised when we do it. That's the point. There's like, you know, if they maybe we don't do a good enough job to say, hey, we are really going to archive this thing unless somebody's, you know, stands up, say, okay, I'll take it over. I think that is a good point. Maybe a bit more of a communication campaign. Yeah. For you know, identify that, hey, this is about to be. EOL and then give it a space of a couple of weeks to yeah maybe communicate more. I mean I think that's a good idea. Although I think the challenge is we don't necessarily know who those users are, right? I mean we don't have a list. We don't necessarily that's have a true, list but... of who's doing what. And we heard that with Ursa, right? I think we had a conversation with some Ursa maintainers, and they're like, oh, I know that these other organizations are using Ursa, but we had never heard of that, right? Yeah, that's true, but maybe we can still post it on the, uh, at least on the repo and sure. I don't know, try to. Yeah, use them. We do have the, yeah, use the channels that we have, right? I think, yeah, I think exactly. that's, yeah, I think that's a good point. Do more of a campaign in advance of this in the future. Because I think we do it among ourselves, that's for sure. But sure. I don't know that this is so visible externally that this is going to happen. Sure, and obviously not everybody's on these calls, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we know they're not. The <laughs> vast majority probably never look at the minutes or sure. So, you said you had a couple points. Was there another? No, no, that was it. That's the second point: is the communication aspect. Uh, the, the yeah, one I agree. There's that being archived doesn't mean they cannot stop using it. Yeah, I mean they cannot keep using it. So that's a good point. I'm taking that note too. Arun is next. Thanks, Arnold. I think uh, adding to your point regarding that a new maintainer can spit in, um, my question or uh, to the TOC over here would be, would we be open for them, for, for let's say a new maintainer to completely take over the project when the project is in, let's say, graduated state or, or a state which requires maybe more attention, like would that, is that something that we want to go over with or we uh, do something to the projects like current life cycle so that um, the community still get the indication that it's a new maintainer set that we have or like how any, any thoughts on that part are you suggesting that if a graduated project goes to end of life and somebody wants to bring it up that would go back to incubation i think that's obviously would be in alignment with our project life cycle because the way that we have it right now uh for like if say somebody wanted to bring hyperledger explorer back to uh, a top level project within hyperledger we would have them go through the proposal process again right um you could consider there to be like a dotted line between end of life and proposal uh, if you will but uh yeah i don't think you'd go directly from graduate it to brand new maintainers that doesn't seem like the the right steps because you would expect that if you were getting new maintainers in, then the existing maintainers would be the ones to bring those people in right um yeah i think um connecting to the previous comment that was my my question related to let's say 
we decide or we we notice that a particular project needs to be evolved and let's say even if we find a communication means to spread this word and we find new set of contributors interested in that particular project what would happen to the uh, project's current state do we still yeah, go sure. ahead and make it evolve and then ask the new set maintainers to propose it sure. back yeah, so David, if you go back to that project lifecycle slide that you have, um, I think the the important steps are the dormant and the um, the end of life states. So if you're in if you're in dormant state, you can you can see that there's no way to go to graduate it, even if you were in graduate it. It goes back to incubation. Um, if you're in end of life, then you have to go back to the proposal. There's no way other than proposal if you're in end of life. Uh, for deprecated, deprecated goes to end of life. I suppose there could be a deprecated somehow back to incubation, but we don't have that currently in our, our life cycle. The expectation if it's deprecated, it's um, you know got six months to be maintained by the existing maintainers and then it goes end of life. Jim? Yeah, Tracy, just a comment on that. Um, the red arrow pointing back. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as a follow up to your to your comment earlier, I feel like um, in the situation where a, a project is becoming dormant, so the current maintainers are you know essentially nowhere to be found. Um, it, we as the TOC may have may be in the right place to do to to do something more so that we can evaluate the situation on a case by case basis and see if the uh, new proposer um, uh, the new committer who proposed to become a committer has enough of a track record to become one uh, and basically override the the, the car maintainers uh, right um, to bring this maintainer in um, rather than saying, well, uh, we have to find the car maintainers and get them to vote you in and there's no other way. Just a thought there. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think, I think the thing that I want to ensure that doesn't happen is that we have a graduated project that is truly dormant, right? the maintainers have gone away and somebody comes up and says, oh, I'll take it on and that it stays in graduated state. That just seems a very wrong sort of place to, to be, right? Because these new maintainers that are coming in don't necessarily have um, the track record of allowing it to be graduated. And the expectation would be, you know, that a project that is graduated has a set of diverse maintainers um, and I would think at that point, you probably don't have a set of diverse maintainers. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I think um, definitely agreeing that there's no no pointer from dormant back directly to graduated. So not arguing yeah. with that. This is mainly for the specific mechanisms of making the, the arrow from dormant back to incubation happen uh, faster in certain situations where TOC can step in and make that happen. Yep, I think we're on the same page, Jim. Any other comments about this part or? And I'm keeping an eye on the time and I know there's another topic after me so I can go through the rest of it fairly quickly, but um, but happy to keep talking about this, you know, in the future, or we could find kind of another forum to work on this together, but I definitely would be happy to iterate on it with people here. Um, and, and David, just to that point, I know Peter is not quite ready today. So if we do go longer, I'm sure Peter would be happy to give you his time. Oh, all right. All right. If that's the case, I'm happy to whatever works best for Peter. That is the case. Oh. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right. Great. Well, I won't, I won't rush through it then. <laughs> Um, so this slide, I did it before. I think it's missing the URSA logo. I created this a few weeks ago. I can come back and add that. But just again, to explain to people that, hey, a number of projects have, you know, now that we're several years old, you know, we, we've kind of seen 
many projects at this point kind of go through the life cycle and let people know that, hey, this is something that happens. Um, and then here I pulled, this is somewhat of an appendix. I was really interested to hear from this. I had, a, again, going back to our point earlier, I think there's all sorts of whys. I think, you know, there's probably a dozen or more different whys. And I had pulled these out. I didn't put them in that main section because I wasn't sure how many of those we wanted. I didn't want to necessarily throw, you know, 12 different reasons at people. But I pulled these reasons about why to get involved with uh, an open source community from a different a couple different places. These were some whys that I saw in one of the Linux Foundation's um, training courses around, you know, contributing to open source. And I thought these were still relevant. So I wanted to to share these with the group. And if one or, one or two of these seem really, you know, really compelling, we can, you know, bring it up and elevate it and put it in more of the, you know, the, the main part of the presentation. But, um, you know, again, I think we can come up with a bunch of different whys, but I don't know if any of these on here seem particularly compelling. I guess this goes, this one, oops, excuse me. Ah, I was going to highlight it. Sorry about that. This one around the standards, I think that spoke to what Stephen had talked to earlier. So that one seems like maybe something we would want to bring up to the main part. Any, any of these other ones seem really, other than the standard ones, seem really interesting or useful or compelling? I'm wondering if we can make some of these like sub bullets to the to the main ones or somehow combine them. And I think that may be part of what Steve was talking about. I wanted to take a step back and look at how these could be structured, maybe combined. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'll put yeah, I will follow up with that. So yeah, we, we put them all in one list for sure. And if we add them all on the list, maybe we could rank them. Maybe we could put plus ones next to ones that seem really compelling to us. And then we'd have a sense of which ones, you know. And maybe relevant. some will bubble up as main points and some will be like sub bullets that support yeah. those main points. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, for sure. And then I pulled the, this is from a different, this is from a Linux Foundation research project that had come out recently, or research report rather, that had come out recently, again, focusing on why, you know, why somebody might want to get involved. And again, you can see several more points. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll copy and paste all of these into one, one long list. But uh, again, I don't think there's any shortage of reasons. It's really what are the ones that are going to be compelling for the audience that we're speaking to, right? And Stephen has his hand up. Yeah, one of the things that I've been uh, noticing and and seeing happen, and I don't quite know how to how how this would fit into this, but I wanted to throw it out there, which is the the thing not to do, which we've seen a number of people basically fork the project for their own use, do a bunch of stuff and then say, oh, we're going to contribute that back. And, and so they have to undo, you know, sort of have to do a whole bunch of work to be able to contribute it back. And, and, and how to get people to understand that's a really bad thing to do. <laughs> it doesn't help you. It doesn't help the community. It doesn't help anybody. Uh, and, and so I don't, these are all sort of, good things to do that's a that's a bad that's a thing not to do and i don't know how it might fit in here but i i'd really like to get that message to a bunch of organizations because yeah. it's it's painful to see like they they know <laughs> um that this is just the wrong way to do it but yet their their momentum in their organization that's how it works like they don't think of 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 doing it the right way. I, I, again, I don't know if that helps, but I just thought I'd throw that out there to the community and say, sort of say, wow. Um, when you see that, um, it'd be really good to to stop people from doing that or, or make clear, you know, how, how um, uh, unhelpful it is. I think that is a good point. And yeah, maybe we could have some sort of anti-pattern slide or something on that. But I wonder also just to explore how, how do they end up that way? I mean, what's your guess? I mean, so if I heard you correctly, you're saying they know that that's not the right thing to do, or at least some people. The yeah, part of it. Know. Part of it is the organization, you know, the larger organization, the people working on it know that it's not so good, but the larger organization doesn't understand open source, doesn't understand yeah. how to contribute, doesn't understand, you know, other parts of it. And so in talking about it, 
um, to those leaders in the company say, yeah. you know, not only do you get these benefits, but you actually wind up hurting yourself if you do it in a way that doesn't support open source. Which I think speaks to the conversation we had last week. Like, it feels like we think largely the developers know that open source has value, but yeah, it's really the people. So is that like the legal team or the executives? Again, just kind of understanding the the different audiences we need to connect with, do you think? Like, yeah, <clears throat> to a degree, it's the, it's the executive and legal team in, in that they haven't realized, um, they haven't put in place the ability for them to contribute so people just don't know what to do like the, yeah. the people doing the code don't know what to do or even the you know the leaders of the of that part of the organization doesn't know what to do yeah yeah so yeah so in that case yeah we don't need we don't need a developer focused conversation for that yeah. right yeah peter I just wanted to add, I agree with everything that's just been said, but I wanted to add that we could also put some hints or clues down in the readmes for the contributing guides that says that using upstream is preferred contributions uh, can go in there instead of forking. And I'm saying this because I have seen in the past developers who just default to the path of least resistance and the path of least resistance often is uh what steven just described which is oh let me just fork it let me do a bunch of changes in a way that i know wouldn't actually get accepted as a contribution on the upstream repo but it doesn't matter right now i'm just trying to get it to work i'm just trying to get it done by the end of this sprint by the end of this deadline that i have at my uh, day job and uh and uh, a lot of times they also either don't know that this is uh kind of a foot gun on the longer term or they just have no choice because of the deadlines yeah so i think uh just as it's kind of an off topic apart from these slides but we could also take steps to call this out explicitly in advance because we don't necessarily get as, as a matter of fact, I pro we probably don't get to have actual conversations with most of the people who end up using the project's dependencies. We don't get to have an interruption there and say, hey, we think we should do it this way because they just see it on the internet. It's freely available and they start using it. I think you have uh, some really good points, Peter. And I think that fits with things I've seen before. I think often people can make rational decisions that maybe aren't to your point, like are, are maybe detrimental to, for them in the long term, but at least in the short term, like you just, like you said, I have a deadline and it's going to take longer to do it the right, quote unquote, right way, open source way, right? Because it would take longer, right? You'd have to go through this whole process mm -hmm. and talk to other maintainers and get a review. Sometimes it's just quicker to do it yourself. So maybe what we'd want we could structure this in a way maybe where we have a list of whys not to maybe, and maybe that gets to what you and, you know, mm -hmm. The, we acknowledge maybe why people don't contribute sometimes maybe and say, Hey, these, these are maybe valid in the short term, but it's going to, you know, maybe have some points about why longer term that's going to, you know, really hold you back. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I think it helps if you call out as in, if, if you explain that we understand why these things are being done sure. and, and that you're aware of yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think you could strengthen that first bullet basically by saying maintaining a fork, you know, on any kind of, you know, long term is, is a huge no, no. I mean, it's a real pain. And I mean, I can tell you in IBM, we are strongly discouraged product groups from managing forks for that reason. Everybody who's tried that knows <laughs> that this is not a good idea. But maybe in the short term it worked, right? Maybe it solved yeah, the yeah. problem. But they that's had. what I mean. But th that still means your plan is to contribute back as yeah. soon as you make a fork and make some changes. If you don't have that plan, you're setting yourself up for trouble. Yeah. All right. That's good feedback. Yeah. I think maybe the, the, and that part is really missing from here. The why why would you make these decisions initially? And then you find yourself in a hole and then you have, yeah, and then it's even harder. And then that's all the more reason not to do it. Like, well, it's just easier for us to not do it at this point. Um, 
Any other comments on either of these slides? Again, I'll pull this out into one doc, but okay, I'll keep going. The next is more just like if we've sold people and why, then it gets into the how. And I think again, we've often jumped to the how in the past. Like I think, you know, we've done a whole get how to get involved in the community presentation. And it was mostly about the how. So, you know, I think the how is great once you've sold somebody on like why to do it, but uh, I think the why definitely needs to come first. But I think none of this is going to be new to anybody, and I can just go through this quickly. But you know, I think this is all stuff that's been around for a while. So just adding it after the the uh, um, the why part, uh, um, and then that was the, the end of it. Uh, um, but would I guess a high level question? would something like this be useful for you? I mean, do you, do you see yourselves taking a presentation like this and having a conversation with people on your end? I think it's useful, David. I think that, um, you know, it may even be useful to have something that can just be shared that doesn't need the, the voiceover. Right, yeah. um, uh, some sort of paper, right, that that people can read. Obviously, the shorter the better, but um, you know, or even like just having having this recording where we've had these discussions, um, and people can listen to some of these comments that have been made. I think would be very useful to to really you know help drive the point about why it's important to contribute yeah all right great and bobby has her hand up yeah david this is great and i know that the onboarding task force we're working on getting the six spots where people come into the community um narrowed down to four personas so that the four personas that are hitting hyperledger um and this is great for like two out of four of them right now so sure. um, yeah, definitely incorporated in the onboarding um, information and stuck in the um, documentation library when we figure out, you know, how yeah, that works. Great, great. Thank you very much for this. Saved us time. Yeah, I'm glad it's useful. And to Tracy's point about shorter is better, maybe we could leave off the how stuff. We can just say, hey, if you want to learn how, you know, there's a whole another set of resource to get, resources to check out, right? And link to those. So I think my two main takeaways are let's put all the reasons why to in one place and kind of iterate the, on them as a group and then really understand which are the most compelling and then maybe identify a, a separate set of why not to's that we've kind of talked about on the call but aren't currently in the slide and put that in there too to kind of acknowledge that hey maybe in the short term this seems like a good idea to do it this way but here are reasons why not right. Anything else that feels useful or, or missing that if we take another pass at this to add? Peter? Just wanted to say that I think it's pretty great already and thank you for the effort put into it. Sure, I'm happy to. Yeah, if it's going to be useful for people, I'm happy to do it. All right, well, I can take another pass and then share it, you know, in the future and get more feedback. Sounds good. Great. All right, so Peter. Uh, we have, I guess, one of two choices here. Um, we can either talk about what this task force is going to be on this call, um, or we can wait until next week to give you an opportunity to put together some initial thoughts that we can actually review uh, together. Um, up to you as to what you want to do. Thoughts? I think we could talk about it. I have some ideas and I would love to gather more input, more ideas from everyone else and then sit down and compile the actual uh, 
of document. So yeah, I have a few ideas that I can go through real quick right now. I don't have slides, okay. so I'll, I'll just say them. If that's okay. Yep, sounds good. So one is to produce a best practices document about GitHub workflow actions. There is very extensive and high quality documentation about this made by GitHub themselves, but it's it's big. It's not something that you can quickly digest in a few minutes. So I figured we could have a very quick getting started document that has a ton of links to the deeper, more detailed GitHub documentation that it leans on very heavily. So I'm not trying to say that we should reproduce anything that GitHub already has because they do have high cost documentation on this, in my opinion. But uh, for anyone who's just getting started with it, a five minute intro on it and uh, and something that shows them how things in other projects have been done that are actually working and things that we think are great. If, if there are patterns that are too specific to be in the GitHub docs as best practices, but we think they should be encouraged and we can put those there as well. And then two more things. Uh, the other one is I figure that we could do a general checkup of existing CI workflows of graduated and incubated projects where the execution times are high. The prime target or suspect for this is Cacti because I know from RISE statistics that uh, we have been running a lot of CI time. We have 15 plus container image builds. Some of those take half an hour to build. And so I'm assuming maybe at least a few other projects have a similar problem, maybe not to the same extent, but I figured we could go through all the task force members, myself included, I'll volunteer myself first for everything. Uh, we could go through some of these CI jobs and take a look at what is it that actually takes a long time and how could we eliminate some of that time. And then also boil that down into another document that, or, or it could be part of the best practices document, just as learnings. And the uh, third one is uh, more of a moonshot kind of thing that is really just a personal interest of mine on improving things is evaluate or try to find self-hosted open source alternatives to what BuildJet is offering commercially, but in a way that uh, the backing infrastructure, the servers that are running the CI jobs are provided uh, through some very cheap mechanism like AWS spot instances or other third party cloud providers that have competitive pricing such as, I don't know, Hatzner. They have, they have very cheap instances compared to the big players. I, I have no idea if this exists. I have no idea if, if there's issues with this, but uh, the task force should look into it and produce a report saying, we have looked into this, we have tried it, and this was the outcome. And it doesn't matter if that was success or, or just a conclusion that it cannot be done for whatever reason, or it maybe it just doesn't exist outright. But uh, we should have a document for people in the future who are wondering the same thing. We should document it. We have gone down this path and we've attempted to do that and then reach conclusions. And then, so these are mine, but uh, if anyone else has anything that you can summarize in a couple of sentences or less, then I am, I am ready to take notes and I will add all of those in there. And then we will have a kickoff meeting where we can divvy up those and we can filter them down depending on priorities. And Peter, I took notes while you were talking and I did put those three items in the chat uh, for this, um for this meeting so 
uh, just if anybody would like to review those and see if there's anything else they'd like to add to this best practices for automated pipelines task force. Um, just FYI, that's out there. Thank you very much, Tracy. You're the best. <laughs> Well, Peter, I'll, I'll add some uh, comments. I do like the, the first two, for sure. I do think they make sense for this particular task force. The third one, the moonshot. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if somebody has the time to go out and evaluate and see what exists, that's great. I don't think it's necessarily a requirement for this, um, for this task force, but obviously I wouldn't stop anybody if they had the time and energy and desire to, to make that happen. I agree. It's it's heavily optional, and definitely the word moonshot. I meant to imply that there's a ninety eight percent chance of not it not working out because if it was that easy, it would have already been done. Uh, but yeah, I just figured, why not throw it on the list and then see what happens. And then um, just a, a question to Stephen to put you on the spot. I think you were the one who originally uh, suggested this particular task force for automated pipeline best practices. Is there anything else that you were thinking to get out of this? Um, I, I think that gets, gets it. Um, The main thing I was looking for, I guess, was making sure that, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it covers it. How to do a release, how to do, you know, what, what to do on merge, uh, on a merge, what to do on a, a release, um, how to publish, um, you know, those getting consistent on that. I think, you know, I look at other projects and I see what, for instance, Timo's done on AFJ and it's, oh, darn, he just left. I got called him out and he's not even here. Um, but he's, that team has done an outstanding job on, on their repository and all of their tools and their, their pipelines. And, and I see the, the just inconsistencies across and that's what I was aiming at. So I think this is a really good, really good progress on getting there and will really help um, other other or other other groups um you know within a project you know within a repo so good stuff all right thanks for that Stephen. any other thoughts on the task force marcus yes yeah, so i think i uh, absolutely agree with peter i mean back best practice uh document about how to use github actions for instance that would be pretty cool uh, but on the other hand, I believe that best practice document should also contain uh, a mapping how the individual project uh, um, performs their build uh, on, for instance, locally at the developer. Because I mean, when you write GitHub actions, then whatever test uh, you're triggering there, I mean, this is triggered on GitHub. But if then people would also use the same infrastructure to run the tests locally before they're actually pushing their code, mm. so someone has to spend some extra thoughts on how to set up uh, their make scripts or whatever, right? Um, I, I think that should also be part of that best, best practice document. So Marcus, you're saying it, it should be part of the document how to run the CI jobs locally on the developer machine? and how to verify that the change I just made will pass the CI, but locally before I actually push it? Well, I, I don't know if that's even possible if you can run the CI job in the same format um, as you can do I have... on GitHub locally. But I mean, usually when you start a project, you write, start writing a make sc uh, script and then you define uh, something, what would you like to run? And then uh, you are happy about the changes or the test passes, then you push it to GitHub and then uh, the GitHub action will be triggered. 
And so, I mean, from my experience, then sometimes you start uh, writing your make script essentially twice. Once you can uh, execute locally, and then the other one, which is understood by GitHub, <laughs> to trigger the job in a different way. And I think, that, uh, yeah, from my experience there, I believe this is sometimes hard. It's, of course, it really depends on the project, but if, if we can also give some... Uh, yeah, guidelines how to achieve that e more or less easily that would be great I, I believe i have looked into this specifically and i found this project that i've been testing out called act or act i'm not sure how to say its name i put the link on the uh, discord chat for you i have managed to get it up and running and i have had uh cacti connector plugin test suites executed on it just by saying this is the yaml file this is the job name go and run it mm -hmm. it was not trivial but it could be done but then i also had some failures with it on jobs that were working fine on github so uh technically theoretically possible but uh, it's not as easy as it sounds like, of course. But we could uh, we could also add some information about this to the document, just as I mentioned, saying, by the way, this is something that the community is working on, not necessarily the high political community, but other people. And if you're interested in more of it, then you can take a look at this project. Yeah, let's definitely look into that. Steven? So oddly enough, Marcus, um, I, I had, uh, we're bringing on some new maintainers um, for our project and they said exactly what you said yesterday, which is how do I run this locally? It's all good to have it all there, but I, I, I don't, I hate put checking in code and then finding out that um, I'm failing tests because I haven't been able to run them locally. So oddly enough, <laughs> that conversation definitely comes up. Um, one of the things I'm thinking of now is we, this is getting into very great detail at um, on particular stacks and particular ways of doing things, you know, use GitHub actions for this. One of the things that we should definitely have, I think, is take it up a level to say, these are the things that a good project has. You know, it has um, linting for code, it has um, unit tests, it has integration tests. And then um, provide, you know, uh, the maintainers a, a list of what what is good um, in a project, and then pointers to particular ones. Because I think once you get start to get down into particular details on things that are are relevant only to some or or have to be applied in different ways, you get into a level of detail that's impossible to maintain. So perhaps the best way is to point out you know good examples um and and have people uh, you know provide a slightly you know a, a top level here's the list of things that a, a, a good project does from this perspective and then here are examples for different types of stacks of of good ones that are done that you can follow um to make your yours better and, and that maybe that's a more generalized approach to get to what we want to get to, which is, you know, helping developers or helping maintainers um, make it easier to onboard, um, build, deploy, and and um, publish their their project. I agree. Uh, checklists. I love checklists in general because uh, they're easy to understand. You know, they have a name and the headline and then it's just a list that you can <laughs> skip through. If you're scanning or skimming a document, then you don't have to go for the entire checklist to understand what it is. Yeah. So I think a checklist is a great addition to the best practices document that I was mentioning in my point one, because it's easily digestible. Yeah.
All right. I think that was good discussion, good start. Um, so Peter, you were as prepared as you needed to be for uh, what the initial kickoff of, of this particular task force is. I think, you know, uh, it's ideal when we start a new task force just to figure out what it is that we want to do um, and come to some agreement on that so that we're all heading towards the same goal and that we're not thinking about different things. And so good discussion uh, for this particular task force. We'll see you obviously again in a few weeks uh, when you come up again, but uh, we'll, we'll be focusing on the, the items that we talked about. So Rama, I think you were also um, either volunteered or voluntold uh, for the badging life cycle um, task force. So I think you are up on the schedule for next week. Uh, Tracy, uh, can I get another week's race? Sorry. Uh, I'll be sure. prepared Is... for the week after. Yeah, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Uh, Arun, uh, Arun signed me up for leading that and I appreciate that and I'm happy to do that. But uh, yeah, I think next week is going to be a little bit tough. I have a paper deadline. So yeah, I can do the okay. week after. Okay, sounds good. Um, is Let's see. I think the other two task force that we have then would be uh, the next one on the schedule then would be security for Arun. So Arun, are you ready to close out the security task force next week? Um, I think we had the, uh, the the meeting this week. I'm not sure if the meeting happens next week on the, the heart. Uh, Tracy, sorry to also uh, be in the can we not move this up camp, uh, but it would be great if we had another week for that just to go to the open SSF. Okay, so uh, Bobby, I'm not sure if you'll be ready next week. Well, or I mean, I think the other option is obviously if nobody's ready next week, we can um, see if anything else shows up on the agenda, and if not, potentially so, cancel for next week. I will Tracy, definitely I can... not be ready for next week. All right, no problem. Tracy, Bobby. I can volunteer for the reviewing process that CNCF follows. I know Hart shared me a few resources that I can go through. I can share okay. them in the TOC channel as well. If others okay, would for also the project, like to go through. For the project review? Correct. Okay, let's make sure then that that's on the agenda for next week. We'll uh, have that. And if anything else shows up, we'll include that as well. So with that, we are right at time. Uh, we will talk again next week. Thanks a lot, Tracy. Okay. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.